So what's your take, Palmer, on this Jedi contract? And I mean, there are a lot of people in this process who feel like it's going just fine and just sour grapes to those who perhaps won't get a cut. You know, I can't comment on specific contract negotiations. What I am glad is that Microsoft and Amazon are both willing to do this contract in the first place. There's a lot of U.S. tech companies that have been pulling out on the DoD. And specifically, Google actually said that they were concerned about working on the Jedi contract for ethical concerns. And so I'm mostly just glad that Amazon and Microsoft are still in there fighting this and that they're, you know, they're, that they're some of our best companies. They've got a lot of really smart people, and they are willing to work with the military. I think we could use a lot more of that, and I would love to see even more companies in the mix. I will note that uh, four Republican Congress people, Mac Thornberry, uh, Elise Stefanik, uh, Robert Whitman, and Michael Turner, did send a letter to the president encouraging uh, this process on Jedi to, to continue to, to move on a pace, saying, quote, we believe that it is essential for our national security to move forward as quickly as possible with the award and implementation of this contract. Now, Palmer, we've talked before about Silicon Valley uh, and the U.S. government and uh, the, the importance of the government having access to the latest and greatest in AI. That's why you started Anduril. As you continue to watch the AI space, the advances uh, on both sides uh, on this, how do you feel about the U.S.'s position? I think we're in a very good position right now. We have some legacy advantages. We also have most of the best universities. We have many of the best scientists that are working in this area. But what we need to realize is that we are definitely at risk of falling behind. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But one of them is that countries like China are willing to work on in artificial intelligence with very little regard for ethics. They're willing to surveil their population en masse to try and gather data to help train their AI systems. Now, I'm not saying we should be doing that. I, in fact, think we should not. But we need to figure out other ways to stay ahead of China, to stay ahead of Russia, and still make sure that we're using artificial intelligence in an ethical and responsible way. And that is going to be one of the great challenges in the next few years. Morgan, hey, Palmer, uh, you got a it's question? good to see you. It's Morgan Brennan. I do, yeah. You, hey, Palmer, it's good to see you. It's, it's, it's Morgan. Um, you mentioned Google before. When Google pulled out of another Pentagon contract, uh, Project Maven, an AI, an AI um, program, Anduril was able to sort of step in and take over that contract. So I, I'm wondering what you think in general, given the fact that you do have this insight on the relationship between the DOD and the tech world, whether you think the U.S. should be considering investigating Google's ties to China. Got it. Well, I mean, I obviously can't talk about most of our contracts for obvious reasons. We have to keep a lot of our work confidential. Um, but I was really disappointed when Google did pull out on that. I think they made a mistake. I think that they were making the wrong decision also for the wrong reason. Uh, there's a very vocal minority of people who are very concerned about the idea of the United States using artificial intelligence as part of the Department of Defense. Uh, but I think that it's really important that the United States maintains a technological leadership. I think it's important that our military retains its technological leadership. And the only way that we're going to be able to set ethical norms for the entire world in artificial intelligence is if the United States is the leader. We did exactly the same thing with nuclear weapons. If we had not been the leader, we would not have dictated the rules. Imagine if the Nazis had been the first people to make practical nuclear weapons. Imagine if the Russians had been the first people to make practical nuclear weapons. And imagine if the United States' best scientists and technologists had, instead of working on the Manhattan Project, said, we're not going to work on this at all because we think the ethical implications are too thorny. We would be in a very different world today, and it would not be the world that we're in right now, and it would be a lot worse. When you talk about, Palmer, the startup landscape right now and the fact that maybe there's not that many startup defense contractors out there other than maybe Andril. On the space side, there does seem to be this emerging marketplace right now. And while a lot of it's focused on commercial space, some of that is also going to be national security contracts. How would you assess that part of the market? I mean, the reason that I started this company is, well, you know, I sold my last company, made a lot of money, and I really wanted to work on something that would actually make the world a better place, not the, the trite version that is spread around Silicon Valley where people pretend that you know, better, better advertising algorithms are making the world a better place. Um, and I think that you're seeing a lot of stuff in the private space sector. You're seeing a lot of really cool stuff in the cybersecurity sector and the artificial intelligence sector. 
Uh, but I think that we need a lot more companies getting into defense. It's very difficult to do business with the DoD as a small company right now. You know, there's only two big success stories in the last 30 years uh, working with DoD. It's basically Palantir and SpaceX. And both of those were product-focused companies. Both of those followed a lot of the same strategies. But one of the things that those two companies have in common is that they were founded by billionaires. And I think that that is pretty messed up, that right now, in order to make a successful defense company, you have to either already be a multi-billion dollar company or you have to start out with a billion dollars from somewhere else. We need to adapt our defense machine so that these smaller companies can get significant contracts and do significant work. Hey, Palmer, finally on VR itself, uh, what do you say to people who argue that we should be farther along in terms of mass consumer adoption of uh, the technology at this point, based on conversations you we were having a couple of years ago? I think that things are going great. I mean, the thing about virtual reality is that it is an inev inevitable technology. It is potentially the final technology. I'm still a huge believer in VR, if you can't tell. Um, so all, everything that companies are doing today are really just dictating how long it's going to take before it becomes the mass market technology that dominates all of the other ones. Um, I think things are actually going pretty well. A lot of the people who are complaining about the adoption of virtual reality are basing that complaint on figures from analysts that were years ago predicting that things were going to go a lot faster than they were. If you talk to the people who are actually building this stuff, talk to the people at Oculus, talk to the people at Sony, talk to the people at HTC, most of them are pretty happy with how things are going. So could things be better? Yeah, but I think virtual reality is doing fantastic. I think it's going to continue to do fantastic, and I can't wait to see what happens next there.